Um, I have like a list of questions to guide the conversation, but uh, feel free to talk about whatever you want to share. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So um, first, uh, introduce yourself and the projects you've worked on in the past. Okay, well, I am uh, Dr. Brandon M. Glover. I am a um, professor at the University of South Carolina in the Media Arts Department. Um, I teach the moving image and uh, the fundamentals of, of digital media arts. Um, I'm also uh, own a small production company called Out the Barns Entertainment, LLC. Um, and I also am the media director of Bible Way Church of Atlas Road, which is a, a mega church here in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, projects, as far as projects I've worked on, um, Hollywood style, I've worked on American Idol for a few seasons. Um, I worked on Hoarders. Um, I worked on a pilot show for a lifetime that never got aired. Um, I've also worked on a couple other projects. Um, I'm trying to think of the other one. I can't remember the other one right now, but that's about as far as what I've done uh, with Hollywood, as far as independent. And I've done tons of shorts um, and I've just released uh, out the Barnes Entertainment. We just released our first uh, full feature lift film, Son of a Preacher Man, um, in September of last year. And right now it is streaming on uh, Amazon Prime, Tubi, and about 13 other digital platforms. Um, can you summarize your most recent film, uh, Son of a Preacher Man? Um, as far as, as like what it's about? Yeah, yeah, basically yeah. like the plot, everything. Okay, so Son of a Preacher Man is a modern day adaptation of The Prodigal Son. I don't know if you ever heard the story of The Prodigal Son, but it's a modern day adaptation of that um, mixed with uh, Dusty Springfield's 1969 hit song called Son of a Preacher Man. Uh, and the story was inspired by that song, um, as you can tell by the title of the movie. Um, and basically it is a love story, but it's more than a love story. It's about a guy who decides that he wants to leave home and, and, and go do things his way. He's tired of the church life. He doesn't want anything to do with the church. Um, so he moves away, um, to another city, has a lot of money. He comes from a, 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 a well-off family, um, but he has a habit and it's gambling. Um, poker. He loves to play poker. Um, but while he's away from home, he meets this girl who he really falls head over heel with. He really does like the girl. Um, but his gambling problem gets in the way of their relationship. So it's a love story. But I think the underlying theme of it is how we, when we make decisions, right, as a person, um, how those decisions don't always just impact us, but they impact the people that we are surrounded by or involved with or in a relationship with. So it's really about his downfall, but it's also about her downfall, which because she was the relationship that she had with him. So, and that's, that's the gist of it. Okay, nice. Um... Much of the film is depicted as Abigail King's past as she describes it to the driver. Um, I was wondering uh, um, if you could walk us through your thought process and using flashbacks rather than a completely linear plot. Because I think it could have been done either way, but I'm just wondering how you, did, how you made that decision. Um, I chose to do the flashbacks because um, to me, the story was, it had a lot to it. Um, and, and, and I didn't want to drag the audience or bore the audience with showing all the details of how it led up to the particular point. Um, if you've seen the movie, um, you, if you notice with Abby, it starts off with her standing in the rain, right? She's standing in the rain and then this Uber pulls up or this, uh, uh, not Uber, but, you know, Uber, Uber like pulls up. Um, I forgot what we, we called it in the movie. We called it a, um, uh, uh, a ride share. Okay. So this ride share pulls up, she gets in the car, she gets involved with this conversation. 
I felt like it was a way, it was a creative way to give the audience the details without bombarding them with trying to show them everything um, and how it led up to that point. Um, so I decided, and I and I actually struggled with that. So, I mean, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Evan. I really did struggle with how I was going to give the backstory um, and get to present day um, to keep this movie, you know, to make it interesting and, um, and keep it going. Um, and that's where the, the ride share, the Uber idea came in. And I was trying to also think modern day, right? Like nobody wants to see a 1969, well, I'm not saying they don't, but I didn't want to go back in 1969 and try to put a plot. I didn't want to make it a timepiece. Um, so I was like, well, how can we tell this story that is dated? Because the prodigal son, of course, is an ageless story. Um, it comes from the Bible. So it's thousands of years old. And then the song Son of a Preacher Man is from 1969, where it's 2023. So the the Uber was what helped me make it modern. So I said, okay, well, a lot of people do ride chairs now. You know, it's, it's a common thing to do. So why not put her in the back of an Uber and she tells this story to the story uh, to the driver. And so the reason that I decided to do the flashbacks was to not bombard the audience with so much information, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um... I thought the cast did a phenomenal job. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to as, hear. <laughs> yeah, as the director, uh, how much of a say did you have in casting, and what were some attributes you were looking for um, in the actors, like for the main roles? Um, so I had a, I had all the say in the world when it came to casting. I did have a casting director, um, Tangi Betty, who did an awesome job. We had multiple casting calls. Um, we had at least three um, casting calls. We had two main ones, and then we asked some people to come back and and, um, and try out for different roles. Um, but my, I let my casting director pick who she liked, and then I made the ultimate decision on uh, the, the top two, uh, which was Marquise um, Bird or Marquise LaShawn, who played Jacob, and then Destiny. Armani, who played Abigail. I wound up handpicking them to myself, but everybody else was pretty much chosen by Tangie, who was the casting director. Um, Character-wise, what I was looking for, I was looking for um, experience. Um, I wasn't so much looking for... Okay, so what I did was I created a character description of each character. So there were certain things about each character, whether they went to college, whether they came from a two-parent home, um, there's all these little details about them um, as a whole, which helps the actors, when they look at these character descriptions, they can become these people. They can, okay, well, this person um, only had a dad, didn't have a mom, um, dropped out of high school, blah, 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 those details. So what I was looking for when we were casting for was for actors that were able to look at the character description and basically become that character. Um, and whoever did the best in the moment, right? Because it's just a casting call. So they don't have a lot of time. They get the size, they read it for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then they get in front of us and they, they act it out. So I was just looking to see who could identify with those character descriptions that I gave the best. And whoever did the best for that partic particular character is, is who we decided to go with for each role. Okay, cool. Um, something that stood out to me immediately um, from the first scene even were the uh, black and white shots um, throughout, throughout the film. Um, how were you able to use artistic elements such as this uh, to invest the audience in the story and the characters? And like, what, what effect were you going for with things like that? So with the black and white, um, what I was trying to do was say, audience, pay attention to these moments, right? This is this is a important moment. It started off in black and white with her in the rain, okay? Why is she standing in the rain is what I wanted the audience to ask themselves. 
when we went to the montage of the, the flashbacks of just those moments that the audience seen that we went to, to black and white, the reason I did black and white there because I wanted to distinguish the moments from where the audience had seen it live already versus, okay, now it's in black and white because that has happened in the past. You've already seen it and it's a moment back in time. Uh, even with the black and white, uh, with the rain, if you notice, we what we wind up coming back to that exact same scene, but this time you see why she was out there in the rain. She just got fired, right? And she just upset. You know, she goes off on a best friend, Dana. Not right now, you know. And in the elevator, it's raining, just the worst day possible. Um, and so I decided, okay, that's a black and white moment. No. Okay, cool. Um, I'm sure you had to cut a great deal of footage, um, which sucks, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. um, how, how did you as a director and a team decide what the audience would be able to experience in the final product? So another interesting question, my director of photography, Michael McClendon, who's also alumni of the University of South Carolina, um, he did the first cut based on the script he did the first edit um i didn't touch it um so i allowed if i would have done it i knew i would have because i wrote it i was too close to it so i wanted to be able to get away from it let somebody else interpret what i wrote and vision by using the script and he shot it so he knew what we shot. He knew what we had. Um, so I let him do that. It took him about six months to do that, um, uh, to get that rough cut to me. And then once he got it to me, that's when I started going in and started directing again. Okay. I don't like this. I do like this. Let's cut this. Let's add this. So basically it was a combination of Michael's interpretation of the script and then I took his interpretation of it and then I kind of molded it together to get the final product that you have. And just kind of a side note, me and him had very, very different um, ideas of what the final project should look like. After, my, after Michael, because he literally just went by the script and he sent me to edit and it was really good. I mean, he cut it really, really good. But from a culture um, uh, standpoint, we had kind of some, some differences there. He felt like Abigail was too pushy um, and came off uh, kind of a, a sort of a arrogant and, you know, I don't want to use the word, but kind of a B-I-T-C-H. And he felt like that wasn't going to resonate with the audience well, that he felt like she should be a likable character. Well, I, I I I had a different take on that. I felt like because of who she was, her character and her attitude, and um, you know, just who she was as a person in in this role, that it made for good friction between all the other characters that she was involved with, her best friend, um, and Dana, and the uh, you know, and Marquise, of course. I felt like she had to have some type of barrier that he needed to be able to break through, to break her down, to get, make her vulnerable to this point where she was so focused on her career, so focused on becoming an executive, you know, and that's why she had those walls up. That's why she, you know, she was kind of, you know, like that type of girl. But after he comes along and she starts to like him, all those walls came falling down. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of what, you know, we had our differences as far as, you know, it, when it came to that, but I wrote it, I directed it. So I kind of just made that call. Uh, I felt like the audience would enjoy seeing some change or some shift in her character throughout the story. And that's why we went the way we went with the final cut. Okay. Um, yeah, I really noticed that friction. It really stood out to me. And like at some points, I was like, whoa, <laughs> like calm yeah. down. But, yeah. yeah. And that's the same um, way he felt, you know, but you know. Yep. Yeah. 
how long did the entire production take all the way from writing to distribution? Woo, long time. Um, I, I came up with the idea in 2012. Uh, that was the original idea. I didn't start really writing it until 2018. So from 2018, it released in 2022. So four years from conception, to, well, not from conception, conception was 2012, but from writing to um, to it being released was four years. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a long time. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, and it would have been, uh, COVID really, really, really slowed us down. Um, yeah. When I was ready to film, COVID happened, lost some people, things of that nature happened. So we probably, it probably still would have took us about two and a half years, but definitely COVID slowed us down by at least a year, year and a half. For sure, yeah. Um, what were some difficulties you encountered and what did you enjoy the most when producing this film? Man, ooh, um, <laughs> difficulties encountered. We could, we could spend days talking about some of the obstacles that we went through, but the, the, I think the biggest obstacles were scheduling, trying to get everybody on the same page at the same place at the same time. That was really hard to do. That was really hard to do. Um, I mentioned COVID, so it was hard to do rehearsals. So we had to rehearse via Zoom sometimes, um, which was hard to do. Um, and then we had some people, including myself, throughout the production lose family members. Um, um, you know, I lost my grandmother. She passed away. Marquise, who's the lead role, he lost two people in his family. Destiny, she lost you know, someone in her family. So we, you know, that was difficult as well because we had people grieving, you know, um, throughout trying to get this film done. So that was really difficult. Um, but what I enjoyed the most was just, I had an awesome crew, awesome cast. Everybody always came excited, you know, ex you know, except when, you know, those times when, you know, they were dealing with family issues. But apart from that, everybody was always excited ready to go. They gave it 100%. Um, it was awesome. And so I, I enjoyed the people um, the most throughout the, the production. That's good to hear. Yeah. Um, are you currently working on any projects that you would like people to know about? So yes, I'm actually working on two projects right now. Well, actually three. One of them I can't really talk about. It's a documentary and it's kind of a a hush hush thing. It has to do with the military and all that good stuff. But that hopefully that will, um, uh, I can't talk about it soon. Uh, but what I can talk about is I am working on a script. Um, the working title is Perfect Vision um, that's going to deal with school shootings. I wanted to do something to address um, gun violence in schools. Um, I'm still going to try to make it, and this is going to sound kind of jacked up the way I'm going to say this. I still want it to be entertaining, but it is addressing real issues. And I hope people walk away from the film with trying to figure out, okay, how can I help um, um, with this whole gun violence thing in schools? What can I do to make a difference? That's one. And then the other one that I am working on uh, is a series, whether it's going to be a web series or TV series. I don't know. I would love for it to be a TV series, but it at least be a web series. And it's called JR. And it is, you've seen Son of a Preacher Man. It is a spinoff of Jasmine Rose, JR, the bad guy in Son of a Preacher Man. Um, I felt like I didn't give enough backstory of who she was and where she came from in Son of a Preacher Man. So, and but people really liked her character, you know. Um, so I was like, well, what if I just do maybe a series based off just her? So I'm working on that. It's probably going to be called JR. I actually already have a teaser done for that that I have not released yet, but those are the two main things that I'm working on. Very well, I'm excited to see all of those. Yes. Um, no, you have, you have uh, plenty of experience. So what advice do you have for aspiring filmmakers like myself uh, who may at some point want to direct their own film? Write it and shoot it. Um, and I know that sounds um, super cliche, super simple, and it's definitely not as simple as it sounds. Um, but the first thing you have to do is write the story, you know, go ahead and write the story, 
If you don't know how to write a script, just write the story. It doesn't have to be in script format. Just get it on paper, pen the paper, or type it up, whatever, you know, is your way of doing it. Get the story out and then utilize the resources that you have, especially as a student at the university. You have access to gear. You have access to cameras. You have access to lights. You have access to audio equipment. Those are the only three things you need because you need good audio, you need good lighting, and you need a camera. Um, take advantage of that while you are able to um, not have to pay any money for that, okay? And then I, I don't know if you're part of the 1080C club, um, but there are film clubs at the university. I would look to seek to join these clubs because that's where you're going to find your cast and your crew because they're already like-minded. They already want to do this. So you don't have to beg anybody to be a part of your film, right? They're already in the film club and you can just kind of pick and choose the people from there. So that's my advice. Why, especially while you're still a student, write it and then join a film club, get involved with the film club. There's a few of them on campus. 1080C is just one. I think there's one um, involved with the sports um, division as well. Um, but get involved with those people Network, get to know them. Like I told you, my DP was alumni from the University of South Carolina. We graduated in 2010 and we still wind up making this movie. So you never know who you're going to uh, meet and how long that relationship might last. So that's my advice. Write it and shoot it and use, utilize the resources you have while you are at the university. All right. Um, that's all the questions I have. Um, would you like to add anything? No, I will just say, Evan, I appreciate you inviting me to do this. Um, and uh, I think you're starting off. I mean, you're already producing right now, believe it or not, right? You are producing. We're sitting here. You're having a conversation uh, with me and it's being recorded. So I would, you know, just like I said, uh, if you haven't shot anything or if you haven't written anything, go ahead and start the writing, you know, and, and then put together your small team and, and, and make it happen. Yeah, thanks so much for joining me today. I really Absolutely. appreciate it. Sorry to have you up so early on Sunday, but I <laughs> no, no, it's got okay. a full day, so this was kind of the only time I had to get with you, but I appreciate it, and uh, let me know how it goes. Yeah, thanks. See ya. All right, talk to you later.